Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today, we're going to go through turret two, which has been restored by the museum, and talk about a lot of the work that we did there about a decade ago. Uh, and then we're also going to stop in on uh, turret number one and just see what one of these gun turrets looked like before the maintenance work. But first, here's a word from the museum. My name is Ken Orson. I'm a volunteer on the battleship New Jersey. I served during the Vietnam War uh, aboard a destroyer. Uh, we are right now on Mount 52, a five inch 38 caliber gun. Takes a lot of work, man hours, plus materials to keep these guns active. They're very difficult without the hydraulics. Everything is manual. We'd really appreciate it if you click on the link below and uh, send us some donations so that we continue to repair our guns, keep them upgraded, and get more in operation. Thank you very much for your donation. So this video is a companion to an way early video we did on work that we did in the engine room to set that up for a tour. Battleship New Jersey has four fire rooms and four engine rooms, and we only restored one of each. That's what we had the money for, and that's all we can show the public. They're largely identical on the inside, if not in their actual appearance, then in most of the same equipment. Likewise with the gun turrets. The, the insides of the three turrets are largely the same, uh, with the exception of turret two being elevated an extra story to super fire over turret one. Uh, and so the museum chose turret two to restore for this tour. The gun houses, the top part of the turrets, had all been previously restored. And you can stop in on them on any regular self-guided tour. Actually coming down into the lower levels of the five-story rotating structure um, took time for the museum to open. And we were open for close to a decade before we got around to this part. Not only did we have to restore inside there, but we also had to restore parts of the ship enough to get to these turrets. Normally, the turrets are accessed through the door under them on the main deck, uh, which you see whenever you access one on a self-guided tour, or through a vertical ladder at the very, very bottom uh, on the uh, fifth deck of the ship. So obviously, guests aren't using a vertical ladder. And obviously, coming in, going down five stories, and then coming up inside the turrets a little bit much. So we decided to cut a hole in the armored barbette to let people in. This hole had to be on third deck or lower, because on second deck, we're above the armored citadel, uh, which means that the barbette is not three inches thick like this. It's uh, up to 17 inches thick because the barbette here is inside the citadel. It really is just structural, structural in holding the armor and turret above it and not uh, thick for armor. The belt has taken over for that. But above, uh, above third deck here, it has to have protection. Now, part of cutting these holes also entailed saving what we cut off so that if the Navy ever takes the ship back, they can replace it. So as you come through here, you'll see that. And you'll also see the uh, little step structure, railing, and electrical that was added into this. Part of this electrical is for fire alarms and emergency lighting. So uh, some museum ships can get by with their original Navy emergency lighting. But in the state of New Jersey, they required a new and purpose-built system. So we had to retrofit that in. We are on the lower shell deck. There are two identical shell decks, one above us and then this one. Um, and this one, because it's on third deck where we're entering, is uh, the one we chose to interpret. So we had to do some work uh, chipping and painting in here. The Navy coatings have largely flaked off, so we had to completely paint the space. And we had to clean up the decks. In service, these decks would have been bare metal, but covered in oil. The oil keeps the bare metal from rusting, but it also allows you to slide the shells around on it relatively easily. Uh, so the volunteers spent forever and a day 
cleaning up the oil in here, and not only the oil that you move the shells on, but also the hydraulic fluid from the various motors and hoists that are used to rotate the turret and lift shells up, uh, which has been leaking down. Um, the oil that was in here was so embedded in the metal that it still seeps up from time to time and needs to be cleaned. The museum acquired a number of real 16-inch shells that the Navy was getting rid of. Our initial intention was to do like uh, other museum ships, earlier museum ships, Massachusetts and Alabama and North Carolina had done, and uh, use their crew, their, their volunteer staff, to load the shells on like they would have normally been and outfitted a shell deck. When those ships opened as museums in the 60s, their World War II era crew was still largely in their 40s. When we opened as a museum in the 2000s, uh, and then opened this part in the 2010s, our World War II crew um, was less up to moving one-ton projectiles around. So we were able to acquire fiberglass reproductions of the shells. Uh, and I believe these came from Battleship North Carolina uh, that was getting a new set. So we, we got the old set, and these, our volunteers could carry in just like they used to carry the one-ton shells. These shells were donated to the ship and are part of the interpretation. So no, you cannot buy any of the fiberglass ones here or the real ones that we keep in other places in the museum. One of the last steps in the process once everything else had been cleaned up, was trying to make the tour interactive. Um, these original hoists to lift a one-ton shell couldn't be activated again, but we could buy a $100 uh, hoist and a cable and hook it up to the original lever to lift a fiberglass shell. And so, The hoist has the appearance of functioning, but we're not running big 440 machinery. Originally, these spaces didn't have any sort of climate control. Uh, and even though we've added heating and air conditioning back into the ship, we're still using the original ductwork, which does not come into a rotating turret, and it does not cut through the armor to get here. And so we had to add things like fans and electric heaters to maintain temperature in this space. Here you can also see one of the smoke detectors that we added. Uh, already mentioned the emergency lighting that's throughout. And finally, access through the various levels of the turret is through vertical ladders, which again, we don't like to make our volunteers or, and uh, our volunteers and guests use. So we cut a new ladder way Interestingly, any new ladders we install have to be up to code. So we have to find space to make them the proper width and angle. Whereas ladders already existing on the ship, usually taller and narrower, uh, because they are an original feature of the historic structure, can be retained as is. Anything that we added like this, we tried to paint yellow to show our guests that this is not original. Coming down to the mezzanine level that only exists in turret two because it's super firing, things like the various gypsy head capstans used to move projectiles had to be removed because they were tripping hazards. And so to make the tour uh, a continuous loop and to give two ways in and out of the space per New Jersey code, an additional hole was cut in the bulkhead here. It has to be a certain width to be ADA compliant and notice that uh, we welded on pad eyes so we could move this piece out and just drop it right there and tack it to the deck uh, so that it is retained. But if we ever need to move it, we can. The ammunition uh, storage rack that was here had to be cut out and that's uh, been stored somewhere else. And another stairway was added to get down. As you come down, you'll be able to see the vertical ladder on the central stalk of the turret that people had to climb back in the day. 
you're welcome for the stairs. Another issue down here is below the waterline, all of these watertight doors have higher lips than around the rest of the ship. So we had to add steps so that um, any sort of mobility impaired people had at least a fighting chance of getting through these doorways. We wanna leave hatches like this one open so that the space below ventilates, but we also don't want small children falling to their death. Um, so covers had to be fabricated. In addition to restoring the turret, we also restored a magazine. The rest of this tour focuses on turret number two. However, the turret two magazines are all crowded to the sides of the ship. Uh, and so it was thought that the turret one magazine, which is large and amidships, would be more compelling. Uh, and there would be room to actually get a full tour group of guests inside of it. This magazine is also how we get through to gun turret number one, which is not restored. So check out this inch thick strike plate on the deck in the magazine where clearly they were dropping these powder canisters as they came through the door. And also look at me struggle to get through this watertight door that's cut so high. So uh, having come through a couple of those really high knee knockers, we are now inside turret one. Notice that there's no mezzanine level. So that deck directly above us is the lower shell deck. Uh, notice the oil stains on the overhead where the grease on the deck has been leaking through. In here, you can see that none of the lights work. These are all old uh, fluorescent fixtures. Some of them don't even have covers. There's a lot of empty racks. Uh, it is possible that volunteers early on took equipment out of turrets one and three to fill in slots in turret two but I'm not confident of that or that it happened or, or, that, or which equipment it might be. You can see that the paint is uh, peeling off in layers. The lower level of primer seem to be pretty well intact, but all of these uh, oil-based paints on top of them are just flaking off. The Navy switched to this white interior color in the late 80s. Uh, and by then they had stopped using lead paint. So we're pretty confident that it's oil-based layers, and so it's easy to just chip off and paint new stuff. Uh, without climate control in this space, the temperature fluctuates greatly, summer to winter, winter to summer, back and forth, and that temperature change causes the paint to peel off even quicker. So it's much worse in an unclimate controlled turret like this than it is in, say, a climate controlled space uh, like one of the spaces on the tour route, which we only have to paint every decade or so. Uh, you'll notice oil and hydraulic fluid on the deck. Uh, not only did we fix, replace light bulbs, we also changed them from fluorescent to LED. So they last significantly longer and cost more, uh, cost less energy. Uh, you can see remnants of the original Navy dehumidification system. And you can also see equipment like this, clearly some spare part or something removed from the line that was just taken out and left here. And imagine the scrap value of all that bronze. Can't get it out of here now. If you wanna use the ladder to get up to other levels, you certainly can but I don't recommend it. If you wanted to go to a shell deck, that's how you would go. Uh, and then the Navy also slathered uh, asbestos hazard signs in spaces like this one all over the ship. Um, the Navy did go through these vessels when they were being reactivated in the 1980s and they removed most of the known asbestos. There, there was some retained in the engineering spaces but uh, any of the insulation that I've inspected in here, like this stuff around the fire mains, is fiberglass. Um, but regardless, some poor shipyard worker was given a, a stack of these and told to go and paste them everywhere on the ship. So virtually every compartment starts with one of those. 
We have to do air quality assurance tests before we open a new space to the public. And uh, so that is another step that we have to do while we're going through this process. And let's say we find a puddle of white flakes on the deck and it's not clear if that's paint or asbestos, although the size of this, it's clearly the paint chips. Uh, we have an outside company come in and remediate that. So a, a question that gets asked is the turret has to rotate. How do you get things like uh, uh, electricity into the various levels of the turret? Well, they all run through the catacombs underneath here along seventh deck up to this central stalk. And if you watch our catacombs video, there's a point in which we crawl into the space directly below this. And you can see this like spider leg arrangement of huge 440 power cables coming up this stalk. And this stalk goes all the way up the gun, which is why it's a good place to put the ladder that you use to access the various layers. It's also got access ports on the side so you can unbolt this and go in and mess with the wiring if needed. Uh, and if these are mounted higher than you can reach from the deck level here, like the one in turret two is because it's superimposed, you climb up the ladder and then there are ladder rungs to hold on to and to stand on on either side of this. Uh, this is for when the ship was in service and the turrets were rotating. We don't rotate the turrets. That machinery doesn't work anymore. But, uh, because we have made cut-throughs all over the place, we were able to run wiring in uh, through the side of the turret. If the turret was to rotate, all those wires would snap and uh, our emergency lighting wouldn't work in there. But if that's what's happening, it's the least of our worries. Missouri is probably being attacked by aliens at that point. And so a process like this uh, usually takes the museum about a year. We've got about 40 volunteers who would join in on a project like this. It takes about a quarter million dollars to go through and do all the remediation and add all the new safety features and get the outside contractors in who need to come in and then to buy the paint that is desperately needed in a space like this. We are in Mount 52 on the ship. Uh, we have uh, two barrels here. We got a left and a right gun. They're five inches. They projectiles tra travel approximately 10 miles. This on the floor is where the powder canisters comes up. There'll be one sailor here just doing that. And the gun the guns projectiles will come right up up here and be loaded here first. And then, and then they're rammed in automatically. When the, these guns are run hydraulically, we have no hydraulics. Everything is manual, whether it's turning the gun turret, raising or lowering the barrels, loading, everything is manual. And we modify the gun so that we can just fire manual. It uh, takes a lot of hours. We have a crew of about six gunner's mates or wannabe gunner's mates that work here. And uh, we're on here weekly uh, firing this, the salute guns, and our quad 40 also. Uh, it takes them a lot of man hours uh, and uh, much better in the summer. It's harder in the winter time with the cold temperatures as these units usually had about 10 heaters in there to keep everything warm. So everything stiffens up in the winter, needing more exercise, more lubrication, and uh, it takes a lot, many hours it could be 20, 30 hours a week working on these guns just to keep them going. I am speaking to two people, gunner's mates and those that are not a gunner's mate. So if you gunner, gunner's mates have a problem with me, I am a BT and it's the best I can do. These are our five inch rounds. They're a little shorter. We've cut them and modified them, put black powder in them, and then we will load the gun and then fire. loaded the shell into the barrel and she's ready to fire but she still has a safety on we're going to remove the safety and then proceed to fire all right i'm going to count down for five our gunner's mate's going to fire the trigger by pushing on the foot pedal next to the left gun and this gun's mount five four three two one fire Donation, you can fire a 40 millimeter saluting gun. Five, four, three. 
three, two, one, fire. Now, if you would like to support capital projects like restoring a space like this, there is a link in the description below. The battleship receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State and also from a number of other places, including viewers like yourselves. And your support has allowed us to go from making one video a week to making five videos a week. So remember to like, share, and subscribe when, uh, so that you're notified when we put out new content like this. Also, if you have any questions about what you've seen, the work that's done here, or ways you can volunteer on board, check the comment section down below. Thanks for watching.